Yellow. Hey, bud. What's up? Oh, just getting going here. Place of disaster? Oh, yeah, big time, bud. Let's make this happen. Sounds good. I'll be up front. Bye. Let's go to the McDonald's house. Let's go to the McDonald's. Let's go to the McDonald's house and play some songs. McDonald's house. Let's go to the McDonald's. Let's go to the McDonald's house and play some songs. Thanks, everybody. This week, uh, it's close to home for me. It's probably the most important topic I'll ever talk about, and it's probably the most important UFO sighting of all time, the Rendlesham Forest incident. Um, so basically, we got the Americans, okay? They got a US Air Force base on British soil. I mean, basically, the Americans are being stationed on this British Royal Air Force base called Woodbridge. They weren't supposed to have nukes on, on the British soil, just like I'm not supposed to eat cheeseburgers in one bite. So 3 a.m. 1980, the day after Christmas, all right, December 26th, you know, maybe some of the guys were drinking some booze the night before, but the day after Christmas, not as likely to be drinking booze or taking LSD. Anyway, let's say somewhere around 40 trained Air Force military personnel, okay, on the base, you know, their family's at home, please come home for Christmas. I can't. I'm working. So they can't go home, you know, and they're pissed, but they're working. And guess what? They see some crazy freaking lights landing in the woods, off the base, going down in the woods, all creepy and stuff. 40, 40 military personnel see it. And they, they basically assume, like, geez, we got some Soviets creeping in the woods, you know, Soviet spy planes. So, guess what happens? Three guys, they get sent out. Let's go find the spy plane. The boys head out, start, stuff starts getting weird immediately. I mean, the spotlights are going out, they're not working, they always work. Radio stopped working, so one of the three guys actually have to hang out by the, just at the edge of the woods, 
to relay messages back and forth because the radios go out, right? So basically the two other guys, Jim Penniston, who that's who this story revolves around. John Burroughs is the other guy. They see the crazy lights moving throughout the trees, like, you know, all crazy and such. And right away they're starting to get creeped out. They walk in a bit further and then they see a craft of complete unknown origin. Six feet tall, nine feet long, it's triangular. It's got like three tripods coming down as landing gear. And apparently it's all black, kind of like opaque or, or like a black glass surface. You know, the, they basically kind of mentioned that they had some sort of electricity feeling that was creeping the frig out of them. And, you know, not to mention the fact that there's all these crazy geometric symbols that are engraved along the bottom side of the craft. So old Jimmy, he's marking down all the symbols, he's marking down all the details of the craft. Boom, next thing you know, the craft takes off into the sky and the boys apparently fell down to the ground just like Mike Tyson giving them a quick shot in the face, you know. Penniston, he tries to make an official report to his lead officers and he's told, hey, forget about it, buddy. And then later that afternoon, a team of officers and such gather a bunch of evidence at the scene, broken, burned branches up in the trees. How did the branches get burned? Must have been a ship there. Impressions in the ground, taking plaster casts, similar to the plaster casts that they take at Bigfoot. Bigfoot's the best. I fucking love that guy. People think, you know, the police that are on the scene looking at these prints are like, ah, oh, could these, these marks could be left by some sort of animal, maybe like a honey badger. These guys are trained freaking Air Force military personnel. We're talking, you know, crank highway to the danger zone, you know, biggest skeptic claim as to what was seen that night was a lighthouse. Yeah, trained military observers who know their aircraft, but the next day, December 27th, guess what? More lights. More lights being seen in the woods. There's some strange shit going on. And this time, the friggin' base commander, his name's Colonel Charles Halt, he sets out to put an end to the UFO nonsense. He know it. He's like, oh, come on. This is obviously a bunch of guys boozing or making up stories. So he heads out into the woods, two other officers, brings an audio recorder device with him to take verbal notes, you know, kind of to talk into it. He used this primitive audio storage device that basically it records and plays back sounds uh, using some sort of magnetic tape, either wound up on a reel or, you know, in a cassette for storage. And so he sees these crazy lights, you know, they're moving throughout the trees. Basically, he describes it as being a giant metallic sphere. It's going orange and red, blinking kind of to, kind of to a black. He also said that it was dripping some sort of a molten metal. The guy is friggin' scared. And I mean, he's the, the base commander. He doesn't have a friggin' clue what he's looking at. He says the thing goes up into the sky, shoots a friggin' laser beam down at his feet. It busts into a bunch of little tiny balls and it just goes out into the, into the sky. And I mean, no one came out publicly with the story until near or after the retirement, as far as I know. Not for fear of being ridiculed, but uh, they didn't want to lose their jobs or their pensions. Can you imagine? You lost your job, you lost your pension, your wife's gonna leave you, she's gonna marry the other guy who's across the street. He's got a, he's got a great job, you know, his name is Billy. The story wouldn't be so important if it was a bunch of random guys, you know, but like I said earlier, trained military soldiers and a colonel. But would Colonel Sanders tell a lie? He wouldn't. I don't think he would. I mean, he kept the KFC secrets of the 11 herbs and spices to the grave. So, right there. It's Ryan, it's Ryan, spot of the week. It's Ryan, it's Ryan, spot of the week. One, two, three, go! Tells me that a pitchfork is handy. Build it up slow.
uh, you guys over at the bar. Yeah, it'd be really nice if we could get some fucking drinks up here. The Wacom! The girl I knew at the factory was trying to hit onto me. I was sure that she loved me so much when she cornered me in the bathroom stall. And asked if I want to kiss her I said that I couldn't kiss her She didn't understand English And that's all that I could have said But all of us Have got to be kind to the lust And I couldn't love her I couldn't love her like that. Two, three, go! Friggin' slam bam, two in a row here. Because if you remember our last one, we did number 20, which was a sweet album. And here we are, number 21, doing a sweet album. It's kind of like when we did, uh, what positions was it? Uh, 16 and 17? No, 17 and 18 were Gun Club albums, the first two albums. I couldn't separate them. And the sixth and the seventh sweet album, I can't separate either because... It's like splitting hairs. It's funny because all my life I thought Give Us a Wink is the best sweet album and that's all there is to it. And I met Deuce, I met Mark Doucette, my buddies, one night. And I'm going on how Give Us a Wink is the greatest sweet album ever. And he just said to me, I think Off the Record is the greatest sweet album. And, and instead of me going into my like, oh no, I'm right and you're wrong kind of tirade, he silenced me. Because I realized that Off the Record is arguably as good as Give Us a Wink. So here we go. Right from number 20 to 21. Two sweet albums in a row. And that's how it was because with Give Us a Wink, that pretty well serenaded me through summer of 76. And, um, and here we go. I think it was June of 77. I met Oasis used record store. I'm saving up for a mini bike so I can't really spend money on records as much as I usually did. And um, but I know the Swede have a new album out so it's kind of dogging on me. But wouldn't you know it, the new Golden Earring album Mad Love and the new Swede album Off the Record come in as used records at Oasis and that was incredible because you know usually people hang on to stuff before they bring it to a used record store. So that was a great thing for me to be able to like get a deal and get this record right when it was pretty brand new. And that was June 1977. I was writing exams, didn't do so good. 
but it was still a great summer because I got a mini bike that summer and this album serenaded me through the whole summer and it was a very sunny summer too. Nice weather and I'll tell you, holy shit man, it's magic in a way because Give Us a Wink is technically a better album because it's the heavy, it's the mega, it's the one that rapes, it's the one that assaults, it's the one that they prove finally after all these years of being a band that they could do it. This album here is more almost they realized that Give Us a Wink was too heavy and it didn't make what Desolation Boulevard, at least the North American version, had done previously in 75. So it wasn't as good as the seller. So they knew that they had the pressure was on to have it come up with a hit. So this record is a little lighter, a little poppier, a little bit sunnier. And it's funny when I first put the needle down on the vinyl and Fever of Love, which is the second single off of this album started to play. I was like, oh my god, is this ever light? You know, whoa, whatever the sweet doing here. But within 10 seconds or 20 seconds, once Brian starts singing, I said, okay, now, here we go. And by the chorus, it was all there. You know, the sweet had not let me down. And wow, the next song on this album, Los Angels, it might not be the best sweet song there is. It's not even probably in the top five, but man, oh man. Even if this album would have stopped at the second song, at that first listen I did back in June 1977, I knew that I had got my money's worth. This Lost Angels is quite a song. You know, we've got to get spiritual minded, not mad there for a bit. And then it continued on from there, and the summer continued on, and I had my mini bike, and I had this album. There was rumblings of stuff to come, but it was the summer before, so. There we go, so we have the sweet, give us a wink, it's the 20th best album in the history of the human race. Friggin' serenading me through summer of 76, and this being number 21, serenading me through 1977, summer of 77. And um, this record is special, holy shit. Incidentally, it has the 75th best song in the history of the human being on this album called Windy City. You know, I always thought White Mice was the best song by The Sweet, but Windy City is, uh, well, you know, you can, there's the other stuff, but uh, we haven't even talked about the juicer yet. But anyway, it's Windy City is number 75. I'm babbling, but as long as you know that Summer of 77, this was a new album by The Sweet, and it again kind of flopped, and it led kind of to the disillusion. There was only one more album after that that Brian was on. So it's kind of sad. People should have been rallying around the throne here and celebrating and making these guys the stars that they deserve to be, but it was not to be. But thank God I was there. I get to hear that joy, hear that before they self-destructed, before they went mellow. And I um, wonder what else we could talk about this album, you know. Mick Tucker's the drummer on this album. You ever hear the song, She Give Me Lovin'? Wow. Man, oh man, I should remember. You know, the, there's even a kind of a bit of a song I thought that was a stinker on this album called Funk It Up David Song. Which is, you know, disco was big and funk was big. They thought, well, let's give it a go, see if we can make a hit. And man, you know, that summer I thought that song kind of sucked. But man, the years go on, you realize that even the one song that they kind of copped out a little bit on, it was no cop, but it's a great song. The Sweet are a great band and you almost got to get mad because the world missed out, but we didn't because this stuff exists and it's a great life and and I love the Sweet and they were the band that held together the mid-70s for me, I'll tell you. If it wasn't for friggin' Richie Blackmore and him forming Rainbow, the Sweet would have been my favorite band in the mid-70s, so there you go. Number 21, the 21st best album, and this would make it the second best sweet album. So there you go. Uh, Mark's made a list of the best albums in the history of the human being. Ah. Records we all should talk about An album we could all listen to this week Let's 
Let's go to the McDonald's house. Let's go to the McDonald's. Let's go to the McDonald's house and play some songs. Thanks, everybody.